Okay. Um, what is going on? Okay, there we go. I don't know why it glitched like that. Oh, well, anyway, five plus nine is 14. So then we can actually integrate now that that's like as simple as it's gonna get. So I have negative x cubed over three, negative x squared over two, and 14x. And then we'll plug it all in. So I get negative eight over three. Um, that'll be four over two, which is two. And then that would be 28. And what am I gonna get when I plug in zero, zero, and zero? Bunch of zeros, right? So this is all I need to work on. That's basically 26 minus 8 thirds. What is going on in my calculator? <laughs> I must have sat on it or something. It just looked weird. Okay, 70 over three. Now, let me see if it wants an exact answer or it takes a decimal. It just says find the region. It never says like round or anything like that. So I have to type in the whole fraction, 70 over three. I'm just gonna submit it. I don't get credit for it, but just gonna see if we get checks. <laughs> yes, we got to check for the graph and then check for the, for the area, okay. Okay, this one's weird. I tried doing one in the video, but you know, sometimes it takes more than one, and especially with all these buttons that we have to, to use. So for 7.1 number nine, let me write these down and then we'll try to graph them. Okay, I mean, you could write six Y minus Y squared, but it doesn't make a difference really. So if I try to graph, they did not give me any bounds in this one, did they? I don't think I saw any. Yep, no specific bounds. So we have to find them then. If I wanna know where these two things intersect, I basically have to make them equal to each other. So I'm gonna take my edited version of that equation or that function and then equal to this one. And I like my y squared positive before I factor. So I'm gonna move both of these guys over to the right. So when that moves, it'll become positive y squared. When that moves, negative six y. And that one's just gonna stay minus y, right? But I can combine those. And now I have 7y minus 7y. And now I can just grab, I mean, you could do quadratic formula, but it takes longer, in my opinion. Because if I set y equal to zero, I just get y equal to zero, right? And if I set y minus seven equal to zero, I would have to add seven over and I'd get y equal to seven. And so those are my two bounds, or at least where they intersect. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I'm going to make a chart. Oh, and I shouldn't be marking seven. Seven what? Not seven X, right? What is this? Y. Y. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right there. But I do need to figure out what the X's are. So I do like to make a chart but I'm gonna have y and then x equals six y minus y squared and x equals negative y. And I know the numbers zero and seven, but if you wanna pick something in the middle, what's exactly in the middle of those two? Mm -hmm. I really don't want to use 3.5, maybe three or four, pick one, four, okay, it's close enough, right, <laughs> okay, so we'll plug in zero, when we plug in zero, we're just going to get two zeros, right, the same thing here, when we plug in zero, we're going to get zero, 
When we plug in four though, I'm going to get 24 minus 16, which is eight. When I plug in four here, I'll get negative four. When I plug in seven, I'm going to get 42 minus 49. Does that sound right? Oh yeah, because it should match this one, right? When I plug it in there, I get negative seven. So let's see, remember these are points. So I have zero for X, zero for Y, eight for X, four for Y, negative seven for X and seven for Y. And for this function, zero and zero and negative seven, seven are the same, but this is my X negative four and this is my Y positive four, okay? So I'm gonna plot those. I have to put them like this. I can't do it backwards. My brain just doesn't do it. So I have to put the points in the right order, okay? That's just me, but I have to. So this was seven, this is eight. One, two, three, four. So right there. And then negative seven, which would be in this direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and positive seven. So about right here. Now, again, this is experience, but I'll just let you know, right? Because you don't need to have all the same experience. You could just take the little tidbits I figured out, right? <laughs> when you have y squared, it always looks like this. But when it's negative, it goes the other way. Okay? Kind of like with the x, right? That parabola always opens up, but then when it's a negative x squared, it opens down, right? So with the y, it always goes to the right for the positive direction. But then if there's a negative in front of y squared, it actually goes toward the negative direction, okay? So I, from experience, know that this is gonna go in this manner over here, okay? But when is it going to hit its peak? If you're not sure, you can plug in any of these values in here and chart, start to see what that's going to behave like, okay? So if I wanna plug in, let's say I plugged in six for y, what would I get? six times six minus six, right? Which would equal zero. And that's my X value. So when I have zero, this would be six, okay? And you can start doing it even more if you wanted to plug in, um, what if I plug in Y values? It's going to eventually look like, I can't draw. I have a feeling that the vertex is at four. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around something before I say it out loud because I don't want to say it and then it'd be false. So what happens if I plug in negative three? Negative three, six minus negative three. Oh, no, it'd be positive three. I'd get nine. So actually it's at three and nine or nine and three. So what I was trying to figure out is if the vertex formula works the same for Y as it does for X and it does, okay? So the vertex here is actually at nine and three. So the function goes like this. And I wanted to know that so I could make sure I graph the, the function correctly. So what I did to figure out the vertex is the vertex formula. Does anybody remember what it is? When it's X, not when it's Y. So if I had a function like this, 
y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. How do you figure out where the vertex is of that parabola? There's a quick little formula. The vertex will always occur when x is equal to negative b over 2a. Always. Okay. So it also works the same way even when it's in terms of y. So if I have this, I could still do it, except it wouldn't be x over here. It'd be y equal to negative b over 2a, right? And in this case, what is the b and the a? If my x is equal to 6y minus y squared, isn't that negative y squared plus 6y? Right? And then this is my a and this is my b. So if I go to try to find the vertex, it's gonna be where y equals negative b over two a, which in this case is negative of six over two times negative of one. So then I had negative six over negative two, which is a positive three. Now, if I wanna know what the x value is there, all I have to do is plug that three in there to figure out what the x is gonna be. So x is 6 times 3 minus 3 squared, which is 18 minus 9, which is 9. So this is going to be the point 9 comma 3 is my vertex. Why do I have to have the vertex? To graph it in WebAssign. If I didn't have to graph it in WebAssign, it wouldn't probably have been so, so important, okay? Because I still would have gotten the shape of the graph and would have gotten where everything was. But since WebAssign wants us to draw it and they have to have the vertex in order to draw it, we had to figure out what that vertex was, okay? And I remembered vaguely that this applied but for sure, so I wanted to make sure before I said it out loud. I tell you, math, you use it or you lose it. And that is completely serious. You use it or you lose it. So if I haven't seen this section in a while, <laughs> I'll forget stuff in here, but we have to remember to bring it back. So I just wanted to clarify that real quick. But yeah, we found the vertex. See, that's the hard part, okay? The other part is the line, and the line's not so hard to graph because that one's just, you just need two dots, right? So we already have zero and zero, but I also need to have negative four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and four. So I've got zero, 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 negative four, four, and negative uh, seven, seven. And so that would be this line here. I'm trying to draw nice, but I'm not the best drawer. Okay. And so then my shaded region would essentially just be all of this mess on the inside, right? But then my bounds, which were zero and seven, zero and seven, okay? So on, on my problem, I had uh, y uh, in parentheses or in the quotations, the uh, uh, five minus y. Mm -hmm. So if you had six, I had five on mine. Mm -hmm. My uh, vertex was, I have, it doesn't, there's no peak to it. It's, it got, I got six uh, comma, two and then six comma three and mm -hmm. that's why it's kind of difficult to draw this in here right because it's not allowing you have to, to have the vertex mm -hmm. yeah it's not it's it's not allowing me to pick either one so we're going to do negative b which is five over two times a which is negative one which is negative five over negative two which is at 2.5 and then if you plug in 2.5 you're gonna get essentially get 2.5 times 2.5, right? Which is what? 2.5 times 2.5 is 6.25. So you wanna plot the point where X is 6.25 and Y is 2.5. Exactly, and that's what I, I tried doing that and it's, it's making me have whole numbers. I can't do decimals. So when I plot the points, it always reverts back to whole numbers. If you go here, you can type them in. 
So I could type in 6.25 and 2.5, and it'll put it right where it belongs. Go ahead and try to draw the, the, the parabola. Uh, curve, yes. OK, so what was the other two points you got? It was also uh, the same thing, but it's going to be uh, 6.25 and 3.5. 6.25 and 3.25. Uh -huh. Okay. And then, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Undo. There it goes. This one is the vertex. So I click on this button. This is my vertex. And then this one's the other. Why yeah, is it, it adding more dots? It keeps bouncing back because it doesn't want you to use the decimals. Should still do it. That's weird. 6.25 and 2.25. No. Hmm, that's weird. Normally it does it. Let me see. Undo. So that, put it there. Put my point 6.25 and 2.5. And then if I plug in another point, let's say yours is Y. So if I put in Zero, I would get zero. So let's do zero and zero. And then this would be this one, and then my vertex, and then this. That's no, the problem see, it shifted it. Yep, it shifted it. And I cannot. Oh, there we go. 6.25 and 2.5. There it goes. Now it'll let you. Oh, go. okay. So just put the points kind of around the region and then fix them over here when you click on this. There you go. Fix but it. Um, for bringing that up, because if somebody else gets a fraction, <laughs> they need to know how to put it in there. Good, good, good. OK, did everybody catch that? In case you get an odd number in yours, right? It's going to give you a fraction. Yeah. So yeah, what you'll do is you'll just put this in a region around. Let me clear this off. So if you know where vertex is, put this somewhere around there. And then you know another point, put it there. And then when you go to graph this, you don't even have to put the, po the points actually, you could just put this. And so put your vertex around where you think it is and another point. And then when you click on this drawdown, you can actually edit those points if they need to be decimals, okay? So thank you, thank you for bringing that one up. We definitely need, I was like, I know there's a way, I've done it. <laughs> I just cannot remember, but awesome. Good, good, good. Okay, now that one wasn't ours though, right? So let's go ahead and put ours in there and then we can finish our little area. Um, so we had a line and our points were zero, zero. So I'm gonna put that one there and then negative four and four. So I'm gonna put that one there. And then it drew my line for me. Now for my parabola, we're gonna click the sideways one because we're doing Ys. And we had a vertex of nine and three, which happened to end up on a nice number. Um, and then another point, we'll just do zero, zero again. Okay, so now it's got those two in there and then we'll fill this in there. Good, good, good. Okay, now when we go to do the area, that part we have not done, right? We've done all this mess, but we haven't actually calculated the area. So when we go to calculate the area, this is a different um, variable, isn't it? When you do DX, we usually use, when you do DX, you usually use the vertical rectangles. For when you're doing dy, you're actually going to have to use horizontal rectangles. And so your rectangles will look like this. 
Now it's kind of weird when you're doing them horizontally because there's no quote unquote top or bottom, right? There's left and right. And so someone else summarized it. It's always the higher value minus the lower value, right? And when you're looking on this number line here, which one has higher values, this side or this side? Okay, this side has the higher X's and that side has the lower X's. So it's always gonna be your right minus your left, okay? So when we do the right function, that's actually the curve function, right? The six Y minus Y squared. Well, the way I wrote it was six Y minus Y squared. And then when I subtract, I need to subtract the line with negative Y. And that whole thing is gonna be integrated with respect to Y. And what are the bounds for Y? Uh, start with a zero. Almost, it was backwards, zero to seven. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you put these in the opposite order, you'll get a negative answer. I saw someone doing that on one of the tests already. I was like, I mean, it's good. They know, but it works out either way. So I'm going to have 6y minus y squared. The double negative will make it plus y. Then we'll combine our like terms. So we actually have 7y minus y squared. And then we can finally integrate 7y squared over 2 minus y cubed over 3. And we'll evaluate it from 0 to 7. So when I plug this in there, what is it going to be? 49 times 7, 343. And when I plug 7 in there, it's going to be 343, but over 3. This one was over 2. And then when you plug in 0, here and here, they'll both be zero, right? So we're doing 343 over two minus 343 over three, which happens to be 343 over six. If I hit the double arrow, it's a decimal that like just keeps going and going, going so you cannot use it. If it were a nice number like 57.5, then you could put in a decimal, it would be okay. But when your decimal is ongoing, you cannot type that in there if it doesn't say to round. So let's go check 343 three over 6. And this one was weird. So I hope we got checks because I don't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah, we got checks. Awesome. Okay. Now, that was the last one that I had because that one was pretty complicated, but I want to make sure that I talked about how to graph them, specifically how to graph a regular parabola and then how to graph the sideways parabolas. And I'm glad that you mentioned that you had a five in there because then that helped us to talk about what happens when we get decimals, okay? Um, but these other ones are very similar. It's another sideways parabola, right, with different bounds. So I'll let you practice. Um, and that's pretty much it for this assignment. There's not too, too, too much. The big idea is if you're integrating with respect to X, your bounds need to be X values and it needs to be the top function minus the bottom function, right? And if you're integrating with respect to Y, then your bounds need to be Y values. Um, and then your functions need to be the right function minus the left function. But then to throw a wrench into everything, we go into 7.2, right? <laughs> So then we start revolving things around things and that gets crazy. And there's more revolving. We just are only getting the beginning of it, which is the, the disc slash washer method, okay? Eventually we're gonna get into this one, which is the shell method. The shell method is confusing. Both of these are confusing. And I have tried my hardest <laughs> to make it make sense. <laughs> Because if you go read the book on these sections, they give you the theorem and then they just set it up and they don't explain to you why is it set up like that. They're just like, oh, well, we gave you the theorem. You should know why it looks like that. And I, it didn't, it, I could not make no sense of why it was looking like that until I did a literally hundreds of these problems and figured out what exactly was going on. And so then I realized that, oh, they use disk method whenever 
the whole graph touches that axis of revolution. And they use the washer method when not the whole graph touches that axis of revolution. But literally, they don't tell you that in the book. When we get to show method, there's some other weird stuff happening. And they never explain. They just tell you, it'll look like this or it'll look like that. But why? They never tell me why. And so I figured that one out. So I'm really proud of my 7.3 <laughs> explanation um, because I did break it down into like what where all the pieces were coming from, okay? And so we're gonna continue doing that with this section, but I did have specific problems that I wanted to talk about. So I wanted to talk about number five. This one might have different numbers, but I'm gonna do the numbers I had earlier. Um, it makes no difference. Um, I actually got pretty close to the same numbers. Um, but this is what mine looks like. And the reason I picked this one is because it's like four in one, okay? It's four problems in one. And if you're on a test and I'm asking you to find the same volume, the same functions, but I might change how they're revolving, um, that's how I realize like whether or not you're you know what's going on, okay? It's the same graph, it's just, are you revolving it this way or that way or what's going on, okay? So I'm gonna draw for part A. I'm gonna do them separately. So unfortunately, I'm gonna have to recreate my graph each time, or I can just draw it over here and erase as needed, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is, um, well, we already have the two y functions. And if I set them equal to each other, this y function equal to the other function, what are we gonna get for x? Just zero, right? And no plus or minus, because zero is the same, right? For both, okay? So if I draw one of the functions, I'll just draw it here. Here's one and here's two. I'm trying to make it as symmetric as possible, but we'll see what it looks like. Okay. So when I plug in zero into the top function, it's going to be zero. When I plug in one into the top function, it's going to be three. And when I plug in two in the top function, it's going to be 12. And it took like an X squared graph, right? So it will be curvy like this. Now x equal to zero, no, I'm sorry, y equal to zero. What does this look like on the graph? What does y equal zero represent? Yes. So that's this line down here, right? And then I have x equal to two which is a vertical line, right? So that one is going like this. And the space where all three of those regions are touching would be that spot inside there, right? So this is the region that we're talking about. The more functions there are, the more confusing it gets to which section you're talking about, okay? So make sure if they tell you these three are your bounds, then those three are the pieces that touch the region. Okay, so I do have that picture in here. Now we got to start doing this revolving business. So for the first go round, it's asking me to revolve around the y axis. Okay, so for part A, I'm revolving around this way. And it doesn't matter whether it's that way or that, way, just revolving around, it doesn't matter what direction you go in. Regardless of whether you go toward the y axis this way or behind it, it's still going to give you the same um, solid. Okay. But since I have this function here and my y axis is my y axis a vertical line or a horizontal line? The y-axis, is the y-axis a vertical line or a horizontal line? Vertical. It's vertical. 
Do you love the planet? Do you do laundry? Sorry. And answer this. <laughs> I have to make sure it goes away. It's so loud. Um, I don't want mine to get loud either. Okay. But what I wanted to bring up in here is that if you're doing a horizontal axis of revolution, then you do it with respect to dx, right? And if you're doing a vertical axis of revolution, then you're doing it with respect to y. Now, I tried to make it make a point to why that is. And when you're doing disk and washer method, when we learn shell method, you're going to realize the big, gigantic difference between the two. For disk and shell method, your rectangles should always be perpendicular to your line of revolution. You don't have a choice. As soon as they tell you what your revolution is and you want to use disk method or washer, you have to use the perpendicular kind of rectangles. Whereas is a little bit different with shell method because shell method, you use rectangles that are parallel. Okay. And the reason why shell method even exists is because some mathematician was adamant about never, ever, ever integrating with respect to Y. And so they said, there's got to be another way. And so then they created shell method, which it wouldn't matter if your ever axis was vertical. You could then also integrate with respect to vertical rectangles, which was DX, right? And so that's why shell method exists. So eventually, once we get to both sections, you should be able to integrate with respect to X all the time, okay? However... There are some times when it is way more easier just to integrate with respect to y as much as you don't want to do it. <laughs> so we'll see all the different kinds of uh, situations when we get to that section. And then at the end, they don't even tell you what to do. They just say, do it. And you choose how you want to do it. Okay. And that's ultimately what we want to get to is I just tell you, revolve this around this and do it however you want. And then you have the choice. Okay. So let's go back to my paper. Since my line of revolution is vertical, I have no choice because we're in this section. I have to do perpendicular rectangles, which means horizontal in this case. And if we're doing horizontal, we're automatically doing it with respect to y. Okay. The width is what that dx or that dy represents. Okay. But I still need to figure out the length. And the length, that's when we do that. Um, that right minus the left kind of idea, okay? So let's get that formula back up there because I just had it and then I closed it. So we need this formula. If I'm doing vertical, it's going to be C to D and then my radius. Basically the area of a circle, isn't it? Or it is pi r squared. That's how you find the area of a circle. Okay, so I got this. Now, if I had to use washer though, it looks a little bit different, right? Because then I would basically need to find the area of one circle and then subtract the area of the smaller circle. Okay, and since integrating gives you area, when you integrate area, you get a volume, okay? That's essentially how it works. It builds and builds and builds. So how do I know which one am I going to use? Is my region touching my line of revolution throughout the whole region? The, no. It's not, it's touching like right there, right? But this graph is not like flat up against the y-axis, right? So since it's not, that means we have to use washer. And this one is disk, and this one is washer. Why do they call it washer? The whole, once it revolves. Mm -hmm. It revolves, and when it revolves, if you have a big circle and you're taking out the little one, what does that look like? It looks like a washer, right? <laughs> Those little things you put on the screws or the, not nails, but usually screws. Um, it literally looks like a washer. And that's why they call it that. Because you're taking one guy's area minus the other guy's area. So you have a little hole in the middle, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna have my pie 
And what are my bounds going to be? Remember their Y values, because I'm doing dy. So their Ys, zero to 12, perfect, zero to 12. And then when I go to put my functions in, when I'm trying to figure out the big one and the little one, it's always the right minus the left. Now what's this right hand side though? It's this line, isn't it? And what is that? That's X equal to, to two. And then on the left is this curve of the region, right? This curve is on the left. And that one is, ooh, I don't know what that one is. I have Y equals three X squared, but I wanna know what is X equal to, right? It has to be in terms of Y. So let's see, we divide, we get this, right? And if we take the square root, we'll get plus or minus y over three equal to x. Now here's the situation. Is it the positive version? Or is it the negative version? It's only one. I don't know if, if you know this, but when you have a parabola that looks like this, um, a regular one goes like that, right? This is x equals to y squared. It's not a function, right? Because it fa fails a vertical line test. But in the past, what we did was we did this and we said, okay, you're only looking at the positive of that and not the negative of it. And then we did the square root, right? Because when you take the square root, don't you get plus or minus the square root of x equals y? And when we do y equals square root of x, we never talk about y equals negative square root of x. Why? Because if I have that part two, it's no longer a function, okay? So the positive one will give you what's on the top and the negative one will give you what's at the bottom. Now, here's the situation. If this parabola is going in this direction, it's going like this, okay? Am I on the positive side of it or am I on the negative side of it? I'm on the positive side of it. And all my X values over here are what? Positive. So should I be picking the one that has X values that are negative? No, we should be picking the one that has X values that are positive, okay? So we have to pick this one. So when I go in here and I have to put my function in terms of Y, it's gonna be the positive. And I don't like it like that. I'm gonna do square root of Y over square root of three. Actually, does it even matter? What's gonna happen to it? They're gonna go away anyway, right? Because when I do root squared, right? It's gonna go away. So when I do this guy squared, I'm gonna get four. When I do this guy squared, it's just gonna become y regular and three regular. And then I can integrate those. Those are not too, too bad, right? Is 4y minus one third times y squared over two. And so when I plug in 12, I'm gonna get 48 minus 12 squared is 144 divided by a six there, I get 24. And then when I plug in zero, I'm gonna get zero and another zero, right? So there's really nothing to subtract there. But I'm gonna have 24. So then my volume is going to be 24 pi. Integration stuff ends up becoming the easy part, right? I would have thought that was gonna happen. <laughs> but yes. Okay, so that's one of them. We're probably, we still have more minutes, but we'll, hopefully we get through these four parts. I, I would be very happy if we did. Okay, I'm gonna leave that one there because the graph is gonna completely change, isn't it? Not, the integral of four is four y. You got it? <laughs> hey, I mean, as long as you can connect the dots, that's what's important. People always tell me because I 
I don't want to ask a stupid question. Who cares if even if you're stupid for asking, you won't be stupid once you know the answer. You know what I mean? Like it's worth asking. So definitely ask. And I ask a bunch of questions in my meetings. Everybody looks at me like I'm crazy, but I'm like, whatever I need to know. <laughs> you want me to do my job? I need to know. Okay. So for part B, this one's different. This one's now the X axes, which I'm going to like a whole bunch better because it's not as crazy as the other one. Three, six, nine, 12, one, two. And I think that's all we had, right? So I'm just recreating my graph again, just cause I am very visual and I do like to have everything there. Okay. So I just recreated the graph. We know it's this shaded region, right? But this time, what are we revolving around? The x-axis. So now I'm going this way, right? So my line of revolution, the thing I'm spinning around is now horizontal, right? So then that means that my rectangles have to be vertical, which we like, well, I'll just speak for you. <laughs> we do like the x because I don't have to mess around with the functions or any of that, right? So when I'm doing dx, am I going to be using disk or washer? Go ahead. Did you have a question? No? Yes? Disc. <laughs> so we're yeah we're we're doing disc this time why is it disc this time and not washer right when i spin it there's not going to be a hole in the middle right it's going to be just completely solid so you're right in this one i do use disc so it's just going to be pi a to b and then r squared oops it's going to be with x though So this one will be a lot easier. So now my bounds are X values. So what are the bounds for X? Zero and two, you got it. Mm -hmm. It goes from here to here, right? But because I'm doing DX, my height, my radius of my circle when I spin it is going to be this length here. So we have to do the top minus the bottom. And in that case, it's just 3x squared minus 0, isn't it? This is 3x squared, and then this is 0, right? But you don't have to write the minus 0. What do I get if I square 3x0, 3x squared? 9x to the fourth. And then if you want, you could kick the 9 out. You don't have to. But if I integrate x to the fourth, I get x to the fifth over five. And then if I evaluate that, I get what, 32 over five minus zero. And I don't know what that is. Nine times 32, I get 288 over five pi. Completely different than the other one completely different answer than the other one because it's a totally different three-dimensional figure that gets created. I'm just going to throw this out there. I know too many of y'all like love this stuff, but I do. And if you want to challenge yourself to make sure that you understand, once we learn shell method, try to do the same problem both ways because you should get the same answer because it's the same figure. Okay, once we learn 2.3 or 7.3. Was there a question? Okay. So now I have this one, the line y equal to 12. So if I try to recreate my graph, 3, 6, 9, 12, it's getting more and more wonky the further. <laughs> More times I do it, but it's okay. It's just to help visualize what's happening. Now my line of revolution is actually the line y equal to 12. So this is my line of revolution. 
And if my line of revolution is a horizontal line, then I should be using a vertical rectangle, which means, yay, I get to use dx again, right? Now this time, are we using disc or washer? Yes. Washer. If I rotate this around, won't I have a big hole in the middle when I rotate it around, right? This part would be solid, but this part would be just a big hole. So I do have to use washer. And that's where it has the outer radius and the inner radius, right? I'm recording, so if you want to see the end, just watch the end of the video, okay? Mm -hmm. So in my case, what would be the bounds for X? My X values here. This little rectangle is moving from here all the way across until it gets to here. So those X values are from zero to two. Now the outer, this one's gonna get weird, okay? I am going, this one is so weird. And then somebody was saying something like, well, this looks like all the rules don't apply anymore. And I'm like, no, that's not what I need you to say. <laughs> this one has to do with perspective, okay? Because you are doing the outer radius minus the inner radius, right? You're trying to get the volume of the solid and subtract out the whole. Your perspective matters here. And I'm gonna turn my paper upside down. If I'm revolving this thing around, okay, the hole is in here, isn't it? So this line here is actually my outer radius. I don't even know how to spell outer, but whatever. And then this in here is the inner radius, okay? because I'm revolving around this blue, this light blue or teal line, okay? But if I turn it upside down, is it really the top minus the bottom? It doesn't look like it when you're looking at it like this, but when you're looking at it with the respectful viewpoint of the axes of revolution, it is minus bottom. It was outer, minor, inner, right? This was the top. And then this was the bottom, okay? So your perspective matters. If my line of revolution happens to be over there, I'm gonna have to look at it from that perspective. If my line of revolution is over here, I'm gonna have to look at it from that perspective, okay? You have to change your view. You have to imagine it rotating and what is gonna be on the outside and what is gonna be on the inside once it's rotating, okay? That's gonna be the hardest part about this volume stuff, okay? So as I'm rotating this, this is where the bold part is. This is the hole on the inside. You want to take out the hole. So this is gonna make one big giant circle, right? And that function is the line y equal to zero, which is really not gonna make any difference here. It's just gonna make a subtraction difference. The hole is gonna be this part in here. So I have to take it out, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's actually, I'm doing this wrong. This is going to get so weird. I'm trying my best to explain it. <laughs> when I revolve this around, isn't this whole part going to be solid? The whole thing is going to be solid, right? So when I'm revolving it around this way, the radius is actually this whole thing. It's 12 minus that zero which happens to just be 12. So my whole radius is 12 when I spin this around, okay? But when I spin it around, I need to take out this section. So when I take out that section, it's actually gonna be 12 minus this graph here, which is what, three X squared? Okay, because this part, I want this piece of the graph not this part, that's 12, and not just from here to here. It has to be the whole section. So I wanna take out that region, 
if I want to remove this in here, it's going to have to be a difference between these two, okay? But when you're flipping it upside down, it's actually 12 minus that. It's so weird. This is like the worst one out of all of them to visually conceptualize. The other part's not, this is not even the hard part. I mean, I'll do it, but it's not the hard part. Oh gosh, now I have to square this, right? So I get 144, that's 36, so 72x squared plus 9x to the fourth. And then these guys will cancel, but then that one will turn positive and that one will turn negative. So this would be 72x squared, take away 9x to the fourth. Um, I think these reduce, what is 72? 72 divided by three. Oh, it's 24. So when I plug in two, that's gonna be 24 times eight, which is 192. And when I plug in two, that's gonna be nine times 32. But when you plug in zero and zero, it's just gonna be two zeros. What is 192 minus 288 over five? 672 over five. And again, this one is different than the other one because the region that gets created looks different. The whole solid figure that gets created is different in every single one of these scenarios. I don't know if that top, that clock is right. I think it is, we still have like 12 minutes. I might be able to, yeah, 12 minutes should be okay to do this one more time. Okay, so if I draw my graph one more time, bear with me. Um, I think the problem, where did I have, oh, there it is over there. For part D, we are doing about the line Oh, this is another one where we have to change our perspective just a little bit. Three, six, nine, twelve, one, two. Okay, so I've got my region again for this one. Let me move that up just a little bit. But I'm revolving around the line y equal to two. One second, there we go. So if I'm revolving the line, the line um, x equals to two, that's actually this line right here that we already have drawn. So we're actually revolving around this. Now, if this shaded region is revolving around that, two things are happening. One, it tells me which rectangles to use. And two, it tells me which formula I need to use based on whether it's touching or not, okay? So because my, vert, my uh, axis of revolution is vertical, I'm going to have to use horizontal rectangles, which means I have to integrate with respect. 
So that's one thing that the axis of revolution tells me. The second thing it tells me is which formula, but that's really based on the graph, okay? So does my graph completely touch the axes of revolution? Yes. It does. So then this time we actually get to use the disk again. Not A and B because we're doing it with DY. So it'd be C and D. And then R of Y squared. So this is why I draw them because if you don't have the figure, like you could probably know whether or not you were supposed to use dy or not, but you wouldn't know if you were supposed to use disc or washer unless you visually see whether that whole graph is touching the axes all, all over, okay? So in this case, my y values are gonna be from zero to 12, just like they were in the other part, okay? But your radius is actually this link here, okay? Now remember, this is the axis of revolution. So I'm gonna put it at the bottom. So when I put it at the bottom, this is my radius. I have to do this height minus this height in order to get this little here, okay? So if I want this link there, I have to do this height minus this height. So it's actually going to be my curve, which was 3x squared, minus this guy here, which was 2. Yes. Actually, I don't have to subtract anything. It would just be, oh, God, no, the two's on the other side. Your y value is this. This is your y value. Your x is, right? Your x is from here to here. And this is the y. So when I'm trying to find this length here, you basically have to take this measurement minus this measurement. So this whole measurement taking out the whole, okay? So I actually have to do two first and then this guy. And I cannot, I cannot put 3x squared in there, can I? We talked about that already. I cannot put x's in here. I had 3x squared in there. Can you have x's and dy? No, right? No, because you're y, right? Right. And we did that the time, but if we don't remember, we're just going to divide by three, then take the square root. And then again, the same situation. Are my x values in this region positive or my x values in this region negative? My x values over here are positive, right? So we're going to be taking the positive radical of this. So it's going to be just square root of y over three. So the right minus the left again, right minus the left again. Now this one's weird because how in the world do I square that, right? It's not just one guy squared, it's this whole thing being squared, okay? So we actually have to multiply it out. I mean, I can leave that like that. I don't like it, but I'm just gonna leave it alone. So when I foil this, it's gonna look really weird, but it might clean up just a little bit, okay? So that times that is gonna be 144. This times this is gonna be negative 12 square root of y over three. This one times this one, negative 12 square root of y over three. And then that one times that one plus square root of y over three, but squared because it's the same thing times itself, right? Now they're the same like radicals, so I can combine them. I get negative 24 of these things. And when I square a radical, it just goes away. So I just have y over three. But there's a problem with that middle term. 
I can't integrate it the way it looks right now. But what I can do is write it like this. And I'll talk that out in just a second. Right, square root of y over three is the same as square root of y over square root of three, which is one over the square root of three times the square root of y, which is one over the square root of three times y to the one half, okay? And since I already had a 24 multiplier in the front, instead of putting one at the top, because I didn't have anything in the front, I put a 24 at the top. Okay, but this denominator just got pushed over to that um, coefficient and then square root of y is y to the one half. And now I'm gonna integrate. So 144y, this weird number, and then y to the three halves times two thirds plus y squared over what? Does anybody know what that? What goes there? Mm-hmm. Sure. Where does that second line where did those cross This one's yes. It's squared. So that means it times itself. Oh, I see. Twelves, not twos. Twos, not twelves. Yes, you're right. See? And it took me forever. That's okay. Just numbers change. So when I multiply that it becomes two, thank you very much. Those become two and those are still squared. You're like, where even, no, this is correct. That's where I got it from. I was like, why do I have 12s there? Because I saw that guy. So this is four, two and two actually does not make 24. It only makes four. And then this guy squared does still come out the house. Then this is a four. And then instead of it having a 24 in the numerator, I should only have a four in the numerator, right? And that guy stayed exactly the same. Then here, this should not be a 24. It should be a four. And that should not be a 144. It should just be a four. But what denominator would I have here when I integrate this? So I would add one to the exponent and then divide by the exponent two but it's already a three down there it would become six right and now here's the crazy weird part so four over square root of three what is l raised to the three halves It's going to be 12 square root of 12, which is times 24 square root of three, as weird as that is. And when I plug in zero and zero and zero, they're all just gonna come out to be zeros. Now this one's nice because these do cancel. So I have four times 24 times two, but divided by three, I get 64. And then 144 divided by six is 24. So 48 minus 64 plus 24 is eight. Five. Again, another completely different number because it was a completely different figure that gets created. So those two, I think are the hardest ones to realize because you do have to like keep the perspective of what's on the outside and what's on the inside as you revolve, okay? But I'll stop this here. We're already out of time. Um, we will come back because I have more that I wanted to cover because I think these also require that weird perspective. So I'm definitely gonna go over um, numbers as well when we come back, okay? And then we'll move into whatever is in 7.3, okay? But try this, I'm gonna keep this open um, until next week because we haven't finished it. 
So it's not going to be due on Friday. It's going to be due next week, but try to do some of them as much as you can and then come with questions when you come Monday. Okay. The 7.1 7. we should be able to do, but 7.2 we haven't finished talking about. So, yes. Oh, all your, your pin doesn't erase when you do that? Oh, mine has. Okay. Guys that are on remote, you guys are free to go. If you have any questions for me, you can hang back. If not, you guys are free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. When I'm leaving, I can't touch anything. I'm like, <laughs>